Hello, good morning. It's Colin Talbot again, uh, talking to experts around the world on how governments are dealing with COVID crisis. This morning, I'm joined by Andre Ragachevsky, uh, who runs a company in Denmark, which is helping the Danish government to develop some IT solutions for dealing with the crisis. And I thought these were very interesting, and Andre has kindly agreed to explain them for us this morning. So good morning, Andre. Good morning. Good to be here. Thank you. So maybe we could just start by you explaining what the two projects are. I think it's two that you're working on with the Danish government and something about your company. Yeah, I, I said Denmark was actually hit by the crisis a bit before the UK. Uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, ski tourists coming home from Italy. And so I think we got hit by um, uh, the crisis a few weeks before the UK uh, and, and maybe one of the first countries in, in Europe. And that also resulted in the government shutting down uh, very fast and very consequently in this country. Um, we've been working with digitalization in the Danish government for the last uh, 20 years, basically, and the last five years with some of the biggest and most critical IT systems uh, both within self-service, but also integrating all types of uh, government systems. And um, having that knowledge about, how, Denmark is actually known for being one of the most digitized countries in the world. Recently, UN appointed us being the most digitized government country in the world. Uh, and the Danes are very used to to uh, be um, being approached by by digital means, uh, it goes for everything here. Even, I mean, we don't have any post anymore. We have everything that comes out of official institutions and banks and, and larger larger companies to to the citizen is sent uh, digitally. Uh, we have, um, of course, digital signature on, on, every, on every process. Even the cars are digitized. Uh, you don't you don't share documents that uh, when you when you buy a car. Um, so. In a sense, Denmark is very much used, was already used beforehand uh, to use digital means. Um, and this crisis uh, made our company, Net Company, which is also situated actually in the four other countries, including UK, where we have 400 people. Um, we decided because of our deep knowledge about how the infrastructure works in this country, in Denmark, to come up with uh, ideas and applications uh, based on our own initi initiative to start with that could fit in and plug it into the existing architectures. I think, and that was the main principle. I think that's also why um, we got started so fast and that we now have two very interesting solutions, as you said, is because we decided not to build everything from scratch, but just look at what is already in there and what is the population ready to use tomorrow, so to speak. I think many of the, the, the big problem with building IT solutions very, very fast which you really need to do in a crisis like this is um, is that you don't know whether they're going to scale, you know, you don't know whether they're going to integrate. And if they don't work the first very first time, we also know by experience that population will probably, I mean, if, if it doesn't work the first two, two days, three days, they will forget about it and you cannot regain the trust of the right. citizen. So it's very important that yes, you have to hurry and you have to bring something out there that can help. Uh, the um, the government in 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 uh, in getting into in, in understanding how big is the crisis, how many people are infected, how what can we do to mitigate, but you also need to make sure that what you produce has a certain level of quality, because it, if it doesn't, um, you probably only have one chance, right? So um, we we decided to do two things basically. Um, one was to gather structurally gather a lot of information from the citizens um, on a weekly basis, um, and and in order to do that, um, you you need to um, you need to make a questionnaire um, available di available digitally on the phones, of course, but also on web on, on the web that has the trust of the government and that and where you're sure you are you're an anonymous person. However, we also need to make sure that there is a right person at the very end of this conversation, right? We need to make sure that, yes, you are 52 years old. Yes, you are a human being living in this particular borough or, because otherwise the information is, cannot be used for any statistical purposes. 
So we've reused what we call, um, we have an identification solution in Denmark, which is used by the banks, but also used by the government and that the population is already using for various purposes. And we use that as a validation mechanism. So when we send out uh, the survey to people and ask them to join in, we ask them to join in and we say it takes only five minutes, but please join in. And you can answer a lot of questions. And then the week after you will be approached again by a new set of questions and that will be assembled into one, uh, into a, a, of course, encrypted uh, database where government then can look at statistics, but they cannot uh, see who gave which answers because we're only using this ID for validation of a real person being at the very end. And when you're in there and delivering your answers, we throw the ID away. Um, and that, of course, uh, in that Sorry, solution... Just, just stop me for a second. Can you please, just explain please. what the purpose of the survey is? What sort of information are you collect? So the, the purpose is basically very, very simple is that, that that, uh, that authorities are aware of what is the condition, the health, the overall health condition of people out there right now. Right. Do you have any symptoms? Did you already have a test? How do you feel after having the test? Um, are you living in a small household with kids or, I mean, all these types of statistical informations. And then week by week, when you gather from a lot of people, you will be able to see the change in the responses. So for instance, okay. two months from now, or one month from now, and Denmark is actually reopening a bit already on Monday, where hairdressers and, and the likes will be uh, allowed to open. We can, we can see week by week, are people answering the questions differently than before? Are, we get, I know, are people less? Do, do we have a lot of people with a cold out there, with a lot mm -hmm. of symptoms? Do we have do we see that the um, people that already had a test are feeling worse than, uh, and it takes a longer time for them to recover? Do we have certain areas in, in the country where people are more con uh, seem to be more contagi contagious affected than, than others? So this is only meant to be yet another KPI for the government and the authorities to have an idea about where are we? Because when we open to open, uh, responsibly, you need data. And to fight this virus, the most important thing, and I think a lot of people would agree with me that you need data. Yeah. But you don't want to compromise with the personal freedom and, and, and all the basic principles uh, that we have, especially in Europe, about how to use data. Uh, you don't want a big brother society, but you need data in order to fight this virus. So it's, it's a balance and you have to make the very best solutions where people feel safe and confident that they're delivering data into a body of uh, institutions that will not misuse it and where and are not, you, you being anonymous is very 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 important and guaranteed it, for you as a citizen yeah can we move on to the to the second application because i yes. think that point is is obviously very important because the second application is about tracking contacts of people who have being diagnosed as having the virus and, and obviously that can't be in or it's more difficult for it to be anonymous in the way that you're talking about from the general survey so maybe if we could just move on to the to the second application that would be interesting yeah the second application came about the same way uh we had the idea we we, we made the application we went to the uh, agency of digitization here in denmark and they together with us looked at it and said this is this seems to be working let's go to um to the health authorities and together we quickly assembled uh, this application that will go, hopefully will be used by the Danes when we start reopening over the next weeks to come. Now, I have to correct you a little bit because this trace, the idea about this trace uh, app is actually that it's not only infected people that are gonna use it. Right. Everyone, everyone is gonna use it. And what it actually basically does, the first phase of this, is to make sure that people are behaving. It's a behavioral tool more than anything else. You know, remembering us, putting, putting into our minds that ah, you have to behave a little bit different than you did before this crisis. Now, so what the app basically does is it's using the Bluetooth protocol on the telephone. That, that's the very same protocol you use to connect to loudspeakers and, and other devices in your car or whatever. And you're using that technology to sniff other phones one, two meters around you. Now, right. we, we don't 
the only thing we're sniffing in the first phase is just serial numbers on phones that are not in any way connected to the to who who owns the phone. We have no idea. The phones are giving an arbitrary number when signed in the first time on this app. Right. And we just count the number of phones that you've been, we just count them. Seriously, right. just count the number of contacts you've had during a day. Uh, and, and and if the number says uh, three and you have, and you're living in a household with four people, well, <laughs> it makes sense if you've been isolated together for a long time. The number says three, your dog is not wearing a, a mobile phone probably. So, so it, it says three, right? So you okay, I haven't met in a lot of new people today. And I, at, at least I've kept distance to the ones I've met. Now, when you start reopening the society in a more responsible way, you can just, this is very anonymous. This is not intruding your privacy at all. It's just a tool and, and more people are using the tool, the more people that download this thing, well, the more accuracy you will have in tell, giving you as the service as, as a user, we're actually giving you something. We're giving you a, some knowledge to remind you, please keep distance. So if you go into the office, you know, in our office, we have signs now saying, um, and this is two meters. Uh, so please don't sit on this chair, but you can sit on that chair because then we know people are sitting with a distance of two meters. Now with this app, you can go into a meeting or you can go, know if around in the office and you pass someone if if you're standing close with in, too close with people in one to two well again you can set the, the time the time as you want um, uh, but you then you can actually count the number of encounters or meetings you've had where you seem to be too close with a person but is this precise no is it accurate Absolutely not. <laughs> Will it ever be a 100% solution? No. And I, and I think we have to remember that because people's phones are, you know, the antennas, the signal could be varying a bit. Uh, it could be that um, you forgot to put your Bluetooth protocol on. It could be because the other person never even downloaded the app, right? So in a, in a, in a sense, this is this is the best we can do to help you. This is the first phase. And the it's, second it's, phase is, of course, when someone gets infected, you can, right. can use, then you really, then this is the second phase. This is, that's more than just behavior and statistics, statistics. That's when you want to detect that you might possibly have been, uh, someone gave you possibly, there's a chance of you getting uh, the virus because you met with someone four days ago. Uh, we will not tell you who, uh, and we will not tell that person who you are. Uh, this is the second phase that we will go into. The first phase is absolutely anonymous. The second phase is also what we call pseudo anonymous, uh, because at the very point, the, the, the point of time that we find out that someone has tested positive, we will go into the government uh, database, which exists already today. It also exists in the UK. You have a place where you register that people are positive. And we will take that particular person and go into the, the serial numbers, if you so to speak, of the phones that that person met, and we will map those into to people and we will send only once we will do this, send an anonymous message to those people saying, there is a chance of you having met someone during the last two weeks that could have brought the virus to you. Now, not tell you who we will not tell you when we will just tell you there is a chance maybe you should have a test done and then we will erase all this information uh every every two weeks we will erase everything so so um this is in denmark we're almost religious about data privacy <laughs> sometimes this is what we're known for. People think you guys are really, you're, you're really trying too much. Uh, some, and, but in this case, we are, I think we're in a, in a particular situation where you need, really need to make sure that the population trusts a, a solution like this. Because if they don't, if they mistrust it just a little bit, um, then you will not have enough people using it. And then it's a great initiative, but then overall it will not have a big, bigger purpose. So you really, really need to figure out exactly how to keep people 
uh, uh, ensured about privacy being taken care of. And I think in this particular concept that we've developed here in Denmark, together with the authorities, because they've been involved and we know all the integrations and encryptions and all the existing solutions, how to 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 put it in there and plug it in into that infrastructure so we are not taking any chances. Okay, can I, can I just explore that issue about the relationship with the authorities in Denmark? Because I'm aware Denmark has a... Uh, a fairly decentralized government system in that local government plays a very big role. Um, and I just wondered how the statistical data, not obviously anonymized, but uh, how the statistical data is going to be used by the various authorities. So for example, if it becomes apparent that in Aarhus or somewhere in Denmark, there's a problem about people not observing social distancing rules, uh, is it possible to to use this this data to for say the local government in a particular area to uh, introduce new rules or reinforce the rules they've already got? Is it is it operating at that sort of level, or is this all national data and aggregated, and only central government can use it? At, at uh, the moment, this is national data, and also because <clears throat> the way the whole thing came, and I think this is health this is health data, in a sense. So. Uh, and when it's health data, um, we really treat it with uh, with a lot of privacy around it. So even okay. though it's very, very anonymous in the first solution, we will we will not in any way uh, relate the person to the data they've give, they've given us. It's all anonymous. That is used by the, the what we call the state serum institute. So this is the uh, health authority that is projecting the development of the crisis in the country overall. Okay. And they're using that data together with all the other KPIs. For instance, how many people did actually uh, got tested positive? How many people do we have in hospitals at the moment? How many people died within the last 24 hours? All these, these tip, we know these KPIs from, from all the news programs. This is just an extra set of KPIs on a national level uh, okay. and, and kept very anonymous. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Can I also ask you, you, uh, uh, it was mentioned to me that you are trying to develop this in other countries. Uh, I was just interested in that because there seem to be several uh, rival or uh, different systems being developed in different places and that Google and Apple, I think, have been making quite a big song and dance about what they're doing. I just wondered where your, your application fits into that sort of scenario. Yes, yeah, so we have, <clears throat> we, I think everyone in Europe or most countries, we were very early on in, in, in and now we are opening up a bit. I think every country more or less has ideas about solutions to help gathering data, but also in this uh, tracing app universe. And we know about uh, applications, similar applications and apps being built in at least six, seven, eight countries in the world and, and more to come. And uh, what we've done is that our app has been, we donated our app uh, to the Danish government uh, so we can start from that point on. But I'm, I am absolutely convinced that over the weeks to come, uh, we, will, we will need to put even more into our app and we are very open about what's going on in the other countries. And you're absolutely right because um, Apple and Google, um, we need to use some of their APIs, it's uh, some of their, their operating systems to make these right. things work. And um, and we we need them to. I mean, we can do some things already now, but it will be much more accurate, uh, especially on iPhones. iPhones have uh, iPhones tend to fall asleep when you use um, the Bluetooth function, and we and and uh, this is a problem for many of the government um, app development projects at the moment. And right. and Apple and and Google are also uh, uh, well, at least they came out with a with the news about some new APIs being distributed and made public over the weeks to come. We are hoping for that. We're also looking into various apps being built in various countries and, 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 and gathering information and sharing that. So besides building the app for the Danish government, which is an ongoing project and which is, and it will be better every week, it will become better and better at doing what it's supposed to do. We will also share our knowledge about privacy and how we handle that here. And we will also share our technique. We have, we've decided to be very open about what we do. 
And in, so, in, so, so new countries should not start from scratch. Or if we can teach something to someone or we can learn something from someone, we will. So during a day, just during one day, we probably have five, 10 contacts with other people in Europe. Uh, and that's in the research um, area, that's in with companies, that's with governments. Uh, and we know that almost every government has a specific set of rules and regulations that they have to adhere to. And I th what I think is an, is an interesting discussion is in Denmark, we know exactly, we are very strict. And some people call us a little bit too strict. I mean, we are very strict on privacy and, 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 and we, we are trying to live up to, to certain standards here because we're so digitized already. And this is very important for us. Now, that does not mean that every country feels the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe some countries want to, to build this tracing app in a different way than we do. Maybe they want to save more data. I've, I've heard that in Norway, they're saving location data, GPS data. So they're saving you know, the location of the citizen. Now, we will not do that. Um, and, and what I think find an interest, which for me is an interesting discussion is then Apple and Google comes out and say, you know, saying we will not, we will not allow certain governments to do certain things on our phones. And I'm like, is Apple bigger <laughs> than any government? Because uh, th this, this is very, a very interesting discussion because if we have, for instance, our authorities saying this is the most safe and private solution that our citizens would love to use, and we know so because they've been using applications of this sort for 10 years, and it has nothing to do with surveillance or Big Brother watching you, and we're using some particular design principle or whatever that Apple does not like, should Apple then be able to shut us down and tell us that we can't use their phones? I mean, I think that's a, we are in a national disaster situation. Each country is in that situation. And, and you actually see that happening in the media now, also in the UK and, and all over the world. People are discussing, you know, we have a government uh, initiative uh, run by the government, made for the population, for the better of the population. And of course, that has to be looked at with, upon with crit criticism and and, and, and transparency and what is it all about and it, it, at the very end if it doesn't reflect the trust that it that you need to give to the public well it will not be used i'm sure because everything is you have countries where you are obliged to use uh, applications but we are not there at all in europe i mean i think every country in europe would probably say this has to be voluntary right like, like in yeah. denmark so if so governments can really make the wrong choices if they don't uh, prioritize privacy a lot, uh, but I think it's 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 bizarre that we have, in particular, Apple, you know, judging what particular governments should do and not do with their citizens. Uh, that's this is a very interesting discussion, and uh, it's and just so shows how, how much power the big tech giants have uh, today on 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 even governments' decisions. I think that's true. Uh, I, I think at that point we're going to have to stop, and that's uh, clearly another discussion which is going to be have, have to be had as this uh, crisis unfolds and solutions uh, unfold. Uh, it's been really, really interesting. Thank you very much, Andre. I would uh, probably like to come back to you in a few weeks' time and, and find out how it's actually worked in Denmark, because uh, I think people will be very interested here in, in how the applications, you're clearly ahead of us, uh, in, in all of this and it would be useful to know how it's actually working in practice once it's rolled out properly so thanks very much for joining me today thank you and you're always welcome to uh to give me another call and, and see how things are evolving here i will do